for one thing, NIL isn't going away. Right. It's like building a plane while it's moving in my book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's the new hot thing that you need to be aware of for sure um, as a athletic director. This is the Work in Sports Podcast. If you want to be an athletic director, I know a lot of you do. You want to work in college athletics and the big dream is I want to run my own program. If that's the case, you better understand name, image, and likeness rules inside and out. Today's show, we brought in a true expert. Jamal Walton is Senior Associate Athletic Director for Sports Administration and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Washington. And I'm chuckling because I don't think I could fit his title into a tweet. I'd hit the character limit. Jamal leads the NIL strategy for the University of Washington and has also worked at the University of Tennessee, Alabama, Florida State, Oklahoma, and the College of Charleston in various roles. He's brilliant and has all the info we need on NIL and more. So if you think college athletics is your key, this is a show you have to listen to. And even further, if you want to get into athlete marketing, there's so many other roles that are influenced by NIL. Young people are getting exposed to opportunities earlier than ever, and that opens up a lot of opportunities for you and your career as well. And this is the foundational knowledge you need. There are more than 17,000 active sports jobs on workinsports.com, but you only need one. Our iMatch tool will scan your resume and find the best matches for your skill set and expertise. Check out workinsports.com today to get started. Hey, Jamal, how are you today? Thanks so much for joining us from the West Coast. Thank you, Brian. I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of this podcast. So in your current role at the University of Washington, you have the longest title I think I've ever heard on this show <laughs> or in my life. You are the Senior Associate Athletic Director for Sports Administration and Strategic Initiatives. That's a lot. That's a mouthful. I hope you don't have to go around shaking hands and telling people that one all the time. Uh, give us the high level. What's, what does that mean? What are your biggest priorities? What does that require of you? So one of the biggest strategic initiatives, um, and I know we'll talk about it, is name, image, and likeness. Um, yeah. When Jen brought me in, that was an area that she needed someone to focus on um, that area specifically at the exec level. So I'm reporting right to Jen. So I'm 100,000 feet up looking down, looking at NIL, and I have a fantastic NIL task force team that's helping me making sure that a lot of the boots on the ground working with our student athletes and coaches is being taken care of. So that's one thing um, from a strategic initiative. That's a, that's a big thing, yeah. Yes, yes, it, it's, a, it's a very big thing. And, you know, I'll even say this when it comes to roles and just responsibilities. If you look at my track record, I've been external, which is a lot of revenue generation, communication, yep. um, multimedia. This job is a little bit more internal, working with compliance, working yep. with academics, working with legal, working with um, somebody may say, why would you do that? You got to stretch yourself sometimes. Yeah. I saw that as an opportunity to showcase that I can work across different spaces and collaborate with different people. Because at the end of the day, you want people that can do that. You want to have people that can do different things and have that responsibility. So someone may be full, saying, well, full school skill set. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, the NIL piece is one thing. Uh, Jen has a lot of things that she just can't get to as an athletic director. Um, so there have been opportunities in this strategic initiatives piece where she's asked me to take on some things. We're doing a community service project that we have not done in a while that involves the entire department. That's been something that I've been working on. Some things from the Pac-12 uh, that come about, um, I'm helping out with those particular things as well. And then when you see sport administration, uh, I have uh, multiple sports that I oversee. Uh, oversee men's basketball, uh, beach volleyball, uh, track and cross country. And if you want to talk about programs, the Husky Band and the um, Husky Spirit program also reports to me. So... I mean, dealing with multiple people, different yeah. types of people, student athletes, coaches, uh, stakeholders, donors, upper campus, you know, ex internal, you know, teammates. Uh, so that's something that I'm dealing with. There's obviously things that may happen for the beach program that's different from the softball program. Yeah. Um, and you have a coach in Coach Tar for our softball program who's an elite coach, won a national championship, um, who has a program that anybody in the softball world when you're a recruit wants to be a part of. And then if you look at our beach volleyball program, we have um, a coach that's in his second year, but our program hasn't had a full-time coach um, until we hired Derek. So lots of different yeah. conversations 
um, which challenges me to just try to be somebody that can move, remove barriers out of our coaches way and our student athletes way so they can be successful in that space. I love that. It's really, it, it must be so interesting to have different sports at different parts of their growth cycle too. Like you said, an established team that's running in a certain way. They still have issues. There's still things you need to deal with. And then a new upcoming team. There's a whole different set of issues that you have to deal with. That must be quite a challenge. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah, It's great. That's what we say in the industry, right? No two days are the same. That's for sure. (laughs) You're right Uh, about that. You know, I've talked with a lot of people in college athletics who aspire to be an athletic director. And so often what they'd say to me is, You have to have experience in fundraising and development because that's what gets things going. Like as an athletics director, you're so often dealing with boosters, money coming in, sponsorship deals. Like that that aspect is is really important. But it almost seems like NIL may be one of those fundamental skills now. If you're going to be an athletics director, having that knowledge and being deep-seated in that, it seems like it would be table stakes now. Is that right? Yeah, I think NIL for for one re- for one thing NIL isn't going away. Right. So um, be nimble, be ready to adjust to what has happened. It's like building a plane while it's moving in my book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's the new hot thing that you need to be aware of. You need yeah, to know it. about it, whether you're a Power Five school or if you're a Group of Five or if you are a mid major. You need to be aware of. Um, what NIL is. And um, I think that for sure, that's a question that a search firm, a president of a university is going to ask someone now, what is your plan for NIL? Um, And sometimes it doesn't need to be um, that grandiose. You know, it it could just be for some schools working with campus, finding what your um, donors and your alums can offer, you know, from a program standpoint, because in the state of Washington, we can only provide education and resources. So I cannot um, sit down, negotiate, facilitate a deal. Right. But education and resources, at the end of the day here at UW, we want to provide the education and resources for our student athletes if they want to be involved in NIL. Some of these kids may not want to, and that's okay. You know, yeah. it's a choice. Um, but yes, you are going to have to I talk have to about it. that for sure um, as a athletic director along with multiple other things, not just um, NIL. Like you said, the development piece is yeah. always key. But I think it's so many other layers you need to be prepared. There's so for. much that goes into <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> NIL is a subject that fascinates me. I've had a lot of guests on the show where we've talked about it. I was always a huge advocate for it. it it's been about two years now. It was June 2021 when the legislation was passed. Yeah. We all had theories back before that of how this was going to play out. Like, what was this actually going to be like? We were all trying to predict what it was going to be like. But I ask you, as somebody that's been very tight with it, what has happened that you expected? Like, this is this is exactly what I foresaw. And what's kind of surprised you in the two years of NIL that maybe unintended consequences or the way people would use it or whatever? Have there been certain parts of it that have stood out? In those regards, I think one thing that I expected was it was going to be a little uh, just messy (laughs) with how um, the process happened, because when you're talking about 50 states, multiple universities, um, I think the NCAA provided guidelines. But keeping all of those schools in line, it's going to get messy, whether you have a good plan or not. And I knew that was going to happen. Um, I think I realized at the end of the day, when it comes to UW, we have to do what's best for us. You know, some states have legislation. Some states don't have legislation. Right. There is no federal legislation. Off of that um, comment right there, Brian, you're going to see people are going to be able to say, well, we can do this here, but we can't do that there. And when you tell a recruit that or when you tell a student athlete that, then their mind saying, well, should I go here? Should I go there? Yeah. And with NIL continuing to grow, that's what confusion happens. You know, that's where you get into that gray area, not so much black and white. So that was probably the one thing that I knew it was going to happen. It was going to be messy. It was going to be some things that people were like, can we do that? Can we not do that? Yeah. You know, um, something that has surprised me. Uh, in in my eyes, is how some of our students are taking advantage of this in a way that's going to help them um, in the long term. 
I knew that there were going to be some student athletes that were just exceptional in this, but I think the creativity of where they can take it and how they can help themselves long term, whether that's getting a job, whether that's you know seeing themselves um, interning with this particular group, I'm seeing more kids realizing it's not about the dollars as it's much about the experience. Um, and that is really, really reassuring to me because I think NIL is a good thing when it's done the right way. I do too. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there trying to tell these kids lies, you know, telling them they should do this, they should do that. Um, and putting these young 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids in situations where they don't have the proper guidance, you know, um, someone saying this, someone saying that, what do I do? And that, that's a lot on anyone's shoulders. But I am just, especially our kids, you know, I'm obviously biased, but some of the kids here at the University of Washington have done some fantastic things. You know, one student athlete, his father, his grandfather had Lou Gehrig's disease and he created a clinic, you know, and all the money went to the to the um, to the to the clinic, you know, to the pro the proceeds went to the charity, you know. So you see a lot of selflessness yeah. you know, in our kids. And uh that's cool. Like that's really cool. That gives me yeah. some faith in humanity. Yes. <laughs> that's great to hear. It really is. Cause unfortunately in the in the media we see the the big the big stories, you know, the big donor uh booster led stories and transfer portals and people moving here for more money or leveraging a deal. And you know it's nice to hear that there's you know, those who are using it for as best good as they can. Yeah. One of my early th theories was that NIL would help some of the smaller programs, some of like the beach volleyballs, the wrestling, the water polo, the softballs, because if they get an athlete there that is really good at branding themselves mm -hmm. and is really out there and maybe they're getting more sponsorship deals, that just signs a light on their program and gets more people interested. So that was one of my early theories, that it would be bigger than just football and basketball, that there'd be smaller athletes that were able to build up a brand and a following. What, yep. What's your point of view? Has that happened? Are we seeing enough buzz for some of these smaller sports that maybe you're, you're in the ground on the ground level with, maybe you see it better than anybody. Do you, do you see that happening as well? Yeah, I, I agree with you um, with, it's not just football, you know, it's not just your top football players, top basketball players. We have some rowers here who are doing some great things in the NIL space. You know, we have some folks in track and field that have better um, social media followings than some of our top players in, in the footballs and the basketballs of the world. I love that. Um, and we also have kids that probably are right now on the bench or probably a third stringer that are doing better because they are investing in time. You know, yeah. well, that's another thing. Uh, you don't have to be you know, the Barry Sanders or the Deion Sanders. Um, well, prime time is Colorado now. now I guess you're speaking I, my, yeah, yeah, we can't talk about Colorado anymore. But, but you're speaking uh, my language as far yeah. as those guys' heyday. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know, you don't have to be the top dog in a lot of these situations um, where you can be successful in NIL. And I think that's the cool thing. A lot of these kids are realizing and leveraging, you know, I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. So some kids are saying, well, I have um, uh, a lot of uh, opportunity back home. So maybe I can go back home and do something. Yep. And whether you are, you know, on the beach volleyball team or whether you're on the basketball team, when you come home, you're home. And I, I think a lot of kids are taking advantage of that. Um, the the woman, you know, the women in this space are doing a fantastic job, which is great. And it's elevating who they are, um, which is which is fantastic. But yeah, I think the smaller Olympic sports are doing very well. Um, the young ladies in this space are doing very well. Um, so it's really how much time are you willing to put into this? Um, if Sharpie, I'm just looking at my, yeah, if yeah. Sharpie sees Brian, the baseball player, if you don't show up on time, if you're not doing what they asked you to do, they're not going to take you whether you are the top player or not. So yeah. I really try to educate our kids that, yes, you're a college athlete, but when you leave here and you do something for a brand, your name is on that. Your you know, business. Washington is on that. And if you have a bad experience or don't do what you're supposed to do, you may not only hurt yourself, but you may hurt you dub. And then other people within your program who may, they, may not get opportunities. But if you do it the right way, 
that helps out everybody. And then down the road, when you're 35 to 38 to 40 to 45, you could be working at Sharpie. Yeah. I think that's a great perspective too, is that it's bigger than just you. You know, you're affecting those who come yeah. after you. You're affecting the, the UW brand. You're affecting your name because that carries with you. That's your brand moving forward too. And to have that attitude towards these, these opportunities is really well, smart. Shout out to Sharpie, man. Yeah, maybe thanks we'll, Sharpie. Maybe we'll get a deal from Sharpie. Yeah, let's get a deal. Let's see you and me. Oh, let's do it. <laughs> I think we're still top athletes. I think they'd want us influencer yeah, marketing. <laughs> uh, so on the administrative side, I'd imagine that you are protective of the student athletes. You want to see yeah. them be successful. And there's a lot of bad actors that get into this space as well. There's a, we've read a lot about bad contracts, people signing over their life rights. I mean, like it's, it's, it can be scary out there too. Yeah. How much do you and the university and any of the places you've been take the side of education and mentorship as, a, as a, an important foundation of this and the guidance necessary. Because, I mean, again, we've seen professional athletes who go and make tons of money and end up blowing it quickly. We've all heard the stories, end up blowing it quickly because they didn't have that education and that background and that mentorship and that guidance. And now we're having younger, they're even younger and getting some of this opportunity and the money coming in and, you know, contracts in their face and people coming right at them with marketing opportunities. How important is you guys for to take a, education and, and mentorship standpoint. Yeah, that is the priority. Um, so just to walk you through a couple things, when we start the year off, we meet with our teams and we go through an educational um, uh, module that basically explains who we are as an NIL team here at UW. Um, we talk with them about everything from the basics, when NIL started, um, what uh, we offer from an educational standpoint. And then from talking to them on the foundational things, we talk to them one-on-one -on -one if they're interested, you know, to talk a little bit more in depth. So team meeting, one-on-one -on -one meetings. And then we also coach the coaches up because that's important yeah. too. Um, we offer multiple things with, within our athletic department. We have a great campus relationship. The Foster School of Business um, has an NIL class. Um, so we have about 40 to 45 students, not just student athletes, but students that can take this take this class twice a quarter um, because we're, we're a quarter school. And that gives um, those student athletes an opportunity to learn and see the curriculum that is NIL, whether that's finances, whether it's um, uh, marketing and branding, yeah. whether that's um, from the legal standpoint. But as you probably are saying, or others are saying, like you just said, 40 to 45 guys, Jamal. Um, but at the end of the day, we also provide plenty of opportunities where we're bringing in different speakers, whether that's from campus or whether that's from some of our partners to talk about um, financial literacy, to talk about, you know, um, those types of areas that are very important in the brand building standpoint. And we have brought in the TikToks of the world, the YouTubes of the world to talk about branding. We've leveraged our um, alumni base yeah. to also talk about branding and just what NIL is, things to watch out for. We've even brought in agents um, of NFL players or NBA players to talk through things that they should be looking for um, within contracts. Uh, one of the other things we're fortunate of, we have a partner in Open Doors. Yeah. Uh, who provides a lot of opportunities. We have an open doors marketplace where our student athletes can find deals, but also educating them with resources that the uh, platform has as well. And then Adidas has been a fantastic partner. Um, they have helped us in the NIL space, but from a branding space um, and from a marketing space, they're, they're fantastic. So those are some of the things that we've been doing. We also have investments from our TIE club, um, we have a TIE subcommittee. We have um, uh, alumni that are invested in NIL and they come um, to those meetings asking what can they do? You know, yeah. we actually put together a brand summit um, last uh, last year where we invited 50 to 75 um, local businesses from Seattle where they were able to come in and listen and hear um, what NIL is and debunk because there's a lot of myths out there, but debunk a lot of myths. And also hear from our student athletes, you know, hear what their stories are and why they want to be in this space and how a business can help them um, be successful in this space. So um, those are just a few areas from the education and resource standpoint. And, uh, you know, we uh, it's, it's a lot. You know, uh, we have a great campus marketing and licensing team on the Hill on upper campus who 
talks about certain things. You know, one of the one of the things that the common things that uh, our student athletes may have trouble with, and I'm sure this is across the country. Um, I'll paint this example. I know he's not uh, no longer with the Seattle Seahawks, but I'm going to use him for an example. But Russell Wilson yep. um, obviously was a Seahawks quarterback. Delta Airlines was the, uh, or maybe still is the um, airline for the Seattle Seahawks. Mm-hmm. Alaska Airlines was the airlines for Russell. So anytime that Russell was promoting Alaska, he never wore any Seattle Seahawks gear. Yeah. And our student athletes, by giving them that analogy, they see, well, why can't he wear it? Because yeah. there already is a relationship with someone else. Yep. So sometimes you have to really just sit down and make sure they understand. It's not that University of Washington doesn't want to support you. Yeah, no, we want to support you. But there's certain things in business that you can and that you can't do. But by breaking those things down and actually communicating to them that on the front end, we help mitigate things where we have to say, we got to actually have you pull that down. Mm -hmm. Or you know what? You can't do that now. We don't want to have, we don't want that to happen here. We want to be helpful. We don't want to be a hindrance. I think that's brilliant. It's so nice to hear. Um, we're, We're definitely sharing a lot of the positives that come out of NIL and I've always been very supportive of it, but there have been some negatives that have come out of it. I think there's a lot of people that fear the pay to play aspect of it. I mean, we've read about where an athlete may be thinking about transferring and the next you know thing you know, a sponsor or booster swoops in and says, we'll give you a marketing deal. And it turns out to be, you know, cars, gifts, thousands of dollars, whatever. And now, now they stay at the school uh, right. and then it becomes an arm race of dollars. Do you think that enough is being done to close some of those loopholes or is that still an ongoing problem? And I'd say that not specific to UW or anybody, just in your experience of, NIL nationwide, because to me, that presents a, a, a problem that that should be have some attention to it. Because we don't want it to become just like SMU in the '80s, where it was whoever could yeah. spend the most had the best team. Yeah, I, I hope so. You know, um, at the end of the day, you know, here at UW, we try to control what we can control, and I feel we're doing the best in, in that area. Um, I, I always make sure that we educate our student athletes to understand if somebody asks you, Hey, I want you to do something for me. I have a deal. And if they tell you what it is and it actually goes against your values, you probably don't want to do that. Yeah. I know that sounds like simple, but it should be that simple. You know, if you realize that you're taking a risk to do something that can affect your future um, and you know, it's not the right thing, you shouldn't do it. You know, But you're right. There's agents. There's family. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I commend the coaches that if someone walks in your room or your office and the first thing they ask you is how much are you going to pay my son or my daughter? Yep. I don't think that's the type of person you want to have in your program or, or family you want to have in your program. You know, at the end of the day, the, what I truly believe is you know, NIL should be an addition to just getting a degree, you know, being successful um, in your sport that you play. Um, And if NIL is something you want to do, you should do it. But if that's the first thing and the only thing, that's not the right way. And that's not what college athletics was set up to be. I hope they continue to put some restrictions on it and that this can be a system that works as, as, as idealistically as it should. Because I think we're both of the same mind frame. It's like, done right, this is a beautiful system. It really is. And there's yeah. a lot of great benefits that come to it for a lot of people. Uh, done wrong, it, it can get pretty messy pretty quick. Yes. So we'll pivot a little bit. Um, I mentioned at the top that you've worked all over the place in college athletics. Um, working in college athletics can be a grind. And you got to sometimes move out to move up. And, you know, to grow that way. Sports broadcasting, where I cut my teeth was the same way. I had to climb up and go into different markets and work in different places. But I also laughed when I looked at your bio from the University of Alabama. You were responsible for the Crimson Tide's marketing efforts for all 21 varsity programs. I mean, (laughs) that's like a 21-person job. (laughs) I mean, not everybody thrives in this environment. It's a lot. It's heavy. There's a lot to be done. There's an urgency and expectation. Why does college athletics work for you? And then what do you think has made you succeed as a, as a leader, as a teammate, all those things that you bring to this environment? Yeah. 
college athletics worked for me uh, first and foremost just because service is, is very important to me. You know, when we talk about values, you know, I'm a Christian and, you know, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gives me so much um, opportunity and ability each and every day. So he was a true servant leader. So it always starts there. And, you know, I always believe service is what I'm here to do on this earth. And 18 to 20, 18 to 21 year olds are who I, I would love to serve. And I'm, I'm happy that I'm doing it here at the University of Washington. So um, that's why I love, you know, being in college athletics is service, um, whether that's our fans or whether that is, you know, one of our alums. Um, so that's the cool thing. That's what keeps me up. That's what keeps yeah. me going. That's what helps me realize what I'm here for. And, you know, every day isn't always a good day, but if I have a tough day, I always fall back on the why. Um, and then it's so much variety, you know, um, nothing against anybody that works in the, the NBA, the NFL, you know, the, the major league baseballs and NASCARs, but that's just one sport to get a chance to see, someone that's coming from a small school or high school and seeing them as a freshman and seeing them evolve from a young man or a young woman into a adult, um, go through good times, go through bad times, get their degree, you know, seeing our coaches um, and how they help these kids move forward in life and then come back. I mean, college athletics is, is, is just one of those special things that it ties everybody. You know, when you think about an athletic event, everybody comes back and they're wearing a color. You know, they're wearing this color and then you got the rival color. But it unites people. And I think that's the cool thing about what we do. It's a unifying opportunity where people can forget about what's going on at home, forget about what's going on at the job and really just enjoy um, relationships yeah. And uh, that's the cool thing about working in college athletics. And you're right. I've been blessed to work at the um, College of Charleston's of the world, to the Alabama's of the world. And I think, you know, what's helped me is just great people. Um, I've always just tried to hang my head on what we talked about earlier with having good work ethic and being a good teammate. But I've had a lot of people who've helped me along the way. And I wouldn't have gotten this far without really great uh, supervisors and mentors who've poured into me. And uh, my job is to do that for the next generation, you know, um, and, and I'm just so fortunate to be where I'm at now. But, uh, you know, I always just try to give my all. And one of the other things I've learned is, you know, somebody may see this senior associate super duper long title, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm still just a, a, a person that's willing to learn, you know, yeah. So if you're a GA and you got a great idea, I want to hear it. You know, it's not about I'm the I'm the big dog in the right. room. No, it's about I'm somebody that wants to learn. I'm somebody that sees whoever's in this room is important and they have a reason to be here. And when you respect people and give them the opportunity to see themselves as a leader, because I believe we all are leaders. You know, um, there may be certain responsibilities, but if you're that entry level person and you're hearing this, you're a leader in whatever your your responsibility is. So when you go into that boardroom and you talk to your supervisor, you make sure that you're the leader of X or Y or Z. And that's going to help everybody in that room see that that person is important. And um, you may not be driving the bus, but if you're on the bus, that's good. But there's going to be sometimes or maybe even Jen, our AD says, Jamal, you know what? I need you to drive. So when you build trust to where you can get things done, people will count on you and you'll count on them. And that's the fun part because you're doing it together. Mm -hmm. I love that. Jamal, this is a great conversation. We'll finish up with this. You're talking so much about, you know, your growth in the industry. We talked a lot about NIL. Let's finish off a little bit of advice for those younger people who may aspire to be in your shoes one day, who look at college athletics and say, that's exactly where I want to be. If somebody came up to you today and were like, hey, I, I want to follow in your footsteps. I want to be at a Power 5 school. I want to be an athletics director. What kind of advice, what kind of a guidance would you give them to help set them up on that, that path? Yeah, um, I think a couple things. College athletics is, is, is a fun opportunity to be a part of, but it's a grind. You know, um, there are certain days, as you probably can see the viewers, I have a family. You know, you have to make sacrifices sometimes where um, 
you know, maybe I'm a little late here, maybe I'm a little late there. Um, but also having a great support system here where you talk to your supervisor and says, hey, this is important to me. I want to be here for my daughter. I want to be here yeah. for, for my son. So I think understanding there's going to be sacrifices. Um, so you, you need to be ready for that. Um, another thing is you're working with multiple people um, in multiple areas in athletics. You know, right after this call, I'm going to be talking to our band director about the budget. I was just talking to our beach volleyball coach about sand, you know, <laughs> and that he, you know, wants to help our student athletes. And uh, after, you know, this, um, we actually are hiring um, a director of social um, NIL um, uh, football position within uh, NIL. So there's so many different things you're going to be doing. You have to be somebody that can collaborate. You have to be someone that is willing to see things from all perspectives before you make a decision. Um, so all of your ideas may not always go through the way that you want it to go through. You know, when you're working as a team, there's going to be certain times that maybe this idea actually is better than your idea. Yep. But if everybody is moving forward and it helps out the good of the group, then that's okay. Um, and then I think attitude and is, is key. If you got a bad attitude, it's going to be tough to make it in athletics. It's going to be tough to make it anywhere. But yeah, it is. you have to have a good attitude because these are long hours sometimes. Sometimes you're going to have coaches calling you in, the, you know, wee hours of the night. You know, you're going to have 15, 20 emails and then sometimes when you have those situations, you have somebody at your door that needs your help, you know, that that is looking for you. And you got to have a good attitude. Yeah. And last but not least. When it comes down to it, you need to be a solution minded person, a problem solver. If you're somebody that's going to walk into your supervisor's office and say, hey, here's everything I, I'm having trouble with. I'm going to drop it on your desk. That's not the way to do it. You need to come to that supervisor and say, here's what I'm working on. Here's a plan of what I believe should be done. Am I on the right track? Or I'm going through these problems. Here are a couple steps that I'm taking to alleviate these problems. Is there anything that I'm missing? That is what that's the that's the way that you want to approach things, because if you're just somebody that's, hey, so-and-so isn't um, helping me out, so I wanted to let you know. Your supervisor. <laughs> I got like 30 other things that I'm working on. Right. So, what do you want me to do about this? Exactly. So yeah. right now, what are they going to say about your reputation? Are you going to be somebody that's, man, Brian comes in, he makes me aware of what he's doing, aware yep. of what's going on, but at the end of the day, he's getting it done? Yep. Or, man, Jamal. That's your brand. Yeah. Oh, this guy, Jamal, man. I mean, every time he brings every time he comes in, it's uh, right. He's something. just like complaining, you know, yeah. bad attitude. Yeah. It's not going to work. So those would just be the biggest things. And last but not least, have fun. Yes. Like, this is a great journey. You you yeah. have to enjoy it and uh, involve your, you know, if you have kids, like for me, I involve my kids. You know, I bring them to the games. I make sure they meet the uh, – the, the coaches and, you know, mm -hmm. the mascots of the world. I think there's a lot of way you can incorporate your job and your family together. You yeah. just can't be afraid of that. Um, and it's so important that uh, you just realize that we only go around this place one time. So have fun, have a great attitude and enjoy the ride. I, I absolutely adore this advice. I think it's fantastic. One of the things I say a lot too is like, you got to celebrate the successes. Like so often in this industry, you do something great. You have a great night at the game uh, some activation is wonderful or you get a bunch of people to do exactly what you want them to. You sell out, whatever. And then it's like right on to the next thing. It's like, right. no, you got to take a breath and enjoy this. You got to be like, yeah. we did good. Like, let's enjoy this moment. I mean, that's a big part of this. Right. No, uh, I love it, Brian. This is oh, great. This is great. This is such a great conversation. Jamal, thank you so much. This has yeah. just been so great getting to know you and to have this discussion. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Want to land more job interviews? Use Work in Sports' iScore tool to see how your resume compares to a specific sports job and get instant recommendations on how to improve it. When your resume matches the requirements of a job, you're going to be in demand. Only available on WorkinSports.com. Thank you to Jamal for coming on the show. Really enjoyed that conversation. I will say I like taking a theme and going deep on it. And there 
is value in there for everybody when it comes to NIL. This is one of the most important things happening in our sports business right now. It influences a lot, a lot of things moving forward. So great to go dive deep into this topic. Thank you for listening, everybody. I hope you got a lot of great information out of that. I did. I learned a lot from Jamal. So please continue to listen, rate, review, subscribe. All that's super important. And I'll be sure to see you on Monday.